Hey everyone, today we are reading Acts chapter 20. We're continuing to follow in the footsteps of Paul on his missionary journeys. This is his third missionary journey that he's on. Now, if you're anything like me, you need context and maybe even visual aids in order to fully understand and comprehend what um, goes on in a storyline and chapter 20 is no different. Now, after the riot in Ephesus, this happened in chapter 19, Paul calls the believers together to encourage them after all this had happened. And then he decides to leave Ephesus. This is where I'm gonna put the map up because he makes quite the journey with many stops. So he travels to Macedonia. Then he goes to Greece, where he stays for three months. From there, he wanted to travel back to Syria, but, but he discovered at that time that there was a plot against his life. So he decides to go by land um, back through Macedonia. At Philippi, they board a ship and arrive in Troas, and they stay a week in Troas. So while they're in Troas, Paul and the other believers, they meet together, and on the last night of their week-long stay there, Paul preaches for quite a long time. It says he preaches until midnight. Now, at this point, um, there was a young man named Eutychus who falls asleep, and they were in an upstairs room, and Eutychus actually falls from the upstairs room to the ground, and he dies. But Paul, right there, brings him back to life and shows God's power can, ri can raise people from the dead. Um, from there, Paul then continues to go back preaching. He preaches until dawn, and then he leaves from Troas. I'm going to put the map, map back up at this point. From Troas, they go by land to Asos. Then they sailed to Mytilene. And then the next day, they sailed past the island of Chios. And the, the day after that, they crossed to the island of Samos. And then one day later, they arrive in a place called Miletus. Now, Paul was in a hurry to get back to Jerusalem for the Passover. So he decided to forego stopping in Ephesus because he knew that he wouldn't be able to just spend a short amount of time in Ephesus. Remember, he stayed in Ephesus for three years. So he would have had developed relationships in this city. So he knew himself and he was said he wouldn't be able to spend a short amount of time there. So while he was in Mytilene, or Miletus, sorry, um, he calls the elders of the church in Ephesus to come meet him in Ephesus. Um, here he talks to them in true Pauline form. This exchange mimics the form of Paul's letters. In his speech to the elders of the Ephesian church, Paul presents his ministry as one that the Ephesian church should try to follow, should try to mimic. He also speaks of his own future ministry that he will continue down towards. He also warns against, um, warns that there will be false teachers and false gospels that will arise. And so he says, stay true to the one that I have preached. And then finally, he encourages them to have the right perspective when it comes to material goods. Let's read a little bit of his speech, starting in verse 18. When they arrived, he declared, You know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Paul says in few words, he says, I have left it all out on the table. 
I've preached the good news everywhere I could and didn't fall back in the face of danger or persecution, which could have very well happened. And then he says something that just challenges me so much. He says, my life here on this earth is worth nothing unless I am doing what God has called me to do. Paul, I don't know if you've felt this, but I think Paul talks and writes in such extremes. But I think it's because he gets and senses that God does not call us to a life of um, mundanes and or a life that is just going through the motions. Paul has showed time and time again that the gospel that he is preaching, he would be willing to die for. This is reflected in his words, his actions, his passions, and his perseverance despite the threats against his life. This not only challenges me, but I also feel a sense of empowerment when I realize what other believers, past and present, have put on the line for the purpose of living out the calling that God has placed on their lives. And it causes me to ask myself the question, how am I going all out for the calling that God has placed on my life? Yes, on a broad note, God has called each of us to make his name known, to share his love and his light with the world. He also has individual callings and assignments for each of us that only we can fulfill based on the way that he has specifically designed and created us. So I ask again, how are you living all out for the calling that God has placed on your life? Paul reminds us in this passage and in other letters, he writes that there is truly nothing better than living step in step with Jesus no matter what may come in the future. If these devotional videos are helpful to you, subscribe to our channel and click the notification button so you know when we post a new video. And of course, please share them with others.